So once again, a hearty welcome to all of you. And uh, I'll quickly introduce the moderator to the panelist. Yeah, first, Sri, the moderator, Sri Anish Ji. So can we have his slide? Anish Ji's slide. Yeah, <laughs> he is, uh, I mean, needless to say, <clears throat> a profound being, a spiritual teacher. Uh, he was in HR. He was a successful entrepreneur. Many of you know that he was a co-founder of People Strong. Then he got a call from the supreme authority of the universe, and he moved to the Himalayas, went on meditation, went on deeper study. So now he's uh, spreading his goodness, his knowledge, nuggets to the whole world. So he founded a great body called Sadhu Sangha in Dharmshala. And his vision is to create an awakened leadership in all spheres of life, including the business world, because he can't forget that, that part of the great world. And he writes, he blogs, he speaks, and his recent book, a wonderful book called Let the Mud Settle, has recently got published, it's available on Amazon. So thank you, Sri Anish. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> we'll move on. I'll uh, introduce our first panelist, dear friend, a great leader, Rajiv Dubey. He is chairman of three of the Mahindra Group companies now. He started his career with Tata Group, the TAS. He spent 21 years there. He rose to the level of the CEO of rallies. He joined uh, Mahindra in 2004 and uh, he was a most successful group president, HR and corporate services and CEO of after market services. He was on the board of Mahindra Group. He retired, but he continues to be associated with them. He, start, he studied in uh, economics. Then uh, he did his MBA from USA. Uh, he contributes to the professional bodies. He was the national president of National HRD Network. He held many positions in the professional bodies. He is currently with the ILO. He's a part of the governing body. And uh, he is also in the National Executive Council of FIKI. Welcome, Rajiv. Welcome. We will move on. Uh, Madam Vinita Sahai, as you all know, so she is the second women academician to be on the uh, legacy of the directors of an IIM. In fact, she is the founder director of IIM Bodh Gaya. Uh, earlier, she was with IIM Raipur. Uh, she was there as the chairperson of industry, international relations, doctoral program, and student affairs. She is widely traveled. Uh, she is a visiting professor of many universities like Aras University. Uh, she attended Global Colloquium and, uh, at Harvard Business School, Boston, Harvard Center, Shanghai. She also participated in uh, several programs like Developing Leaders, Governance, Management, Higher Education. She did her, uh, uh, I mean, that's not important. She is the director. She started, of course, she's from a marketing stream. She is first class with gold medal in MA in economics and done PhD on consumer value with about 23 years experience. She has published several uh, papers. Uh, she has authored uh, five books and uh, she organized successful international level organizations. Madam Vinita ji, welcome, welcome. Our uh, third most and the most important one of them is uh, Mr. Vinod Sud. Uh, he is the co-founder and MD of Hughes Cystic Corporation. Uh, he is on the board of uh, Hughes Communications India. Earlier, he had worked with HSS and CDOT. He was part of the core team which designed the first digital switch. Uh, we know he is a veteran in the high-tech uh, software industry. An exceptional track record of building profitable and sustainable institutions. He's a member of NASCOM, uh, Regional Engineering Council, He's the chair of Northern Indian Council. He's a member of the advisory committee of uh, Institute of Informatics. He's on the several boards of several universities. He's actively involved in guiding, mentoring entrepreneurs. He's on the advisory board of some of the, these setups. In fact, he's mentoring his passion. 
and uh, i personally know he mentored one young boy from the state of odisha uh, he is now a global leader guess uh, now i'll the rules the format of the now uh, welcome vinod bhai welcome the welcome so the format will be uh, our moderator sri anish will set the contest and he will share his uh, vision on the subject then he will involve our three veteran panelists in the form of a panel discussion he will raise a question and there will be a conversation around that and they will give room for uh, question answers from the audience so the audience are requested to put their questions in the chat box start with a capital q so that we will not miss out your question sometimes it's a comment or a greeting question should be with q so that we'll pick that question and then uh, we will again request sri anish to sum it up so that's how we'll spend these next uh, 80 85 minutes so with that i would uh, hand over the stage to sri anish the moderator sri anish thank you thank you gp for such warm welcome to all of us uh, i again once again uh, welcome my co-panelists the esteemed dear friends and co-panelists it's an honor to have you all here um, i also welcome all the participants today the fact that we have uh, almost 150 friends join us on this cold winter more cold winter winter morning of sunday uh, on this topic shows that we're all interested in creating a more kind world around us and especially in our business world as you know as gp said that uh this session is part of a series that we're doing and we call it awakening the leadership series because uh we feel if the leaders of a nation are awakened and especially leaders of a of a business entity of the business institutions are awakened then that awakening will flow to all the people even at the bottom of the pyramid it will go to uh houses it will go to the entire society and probably the entire society can be awakened if the leaders are awakened so this is our effort towards that <clears throat> now i'll just take a few minutes to set the context for today's discussion from survival of the fittest to survival of the kindest you know since childhood we've heard this and somehow it has always been uh told to us that this is more like a law survival of the fittest is more like a law and when we hear this as a law survival of the fittest the undertone of this is as if life is a war life is a struggle life is a race uh, and only the fastest or the most strongest will survive and this is a jungle out there this is the perception that you get since childhood when you hear this statement and it creates a lot of pressure and suffering then because we we trying to protect ourselves from all the sides then if this becomes the 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 philosophy on which we build our life or careers and when we hear this you know from since the childhood to the college to the corporate to the to the to the business world it feels as if we've converted or we we are treating our karm kshetra the field of our action as yuddha kshetra as the field of a war we've kind of somehow mixed these two and and i feel businesses are not battlefield absolutely not the genesis i think we got it we got it wrong from the time of charles darwin when uh, this whole theory came up in fact the the fact is that charles darwin in his theory of evolution never even used this word the survival of the fittest this phrase was coined by a gentleman called herbert spencer who was a british philosopher of course in 1869 charles darwin used this phrase of herbert spencer which was not charles original phrase he didn't coin it but he used it in his book that's that's for sure and somehow we associated this phrase with charles darwin so the factually it is not from charles darwin and when i looked at it little more deeply you know herbert spencer operated thought from a british imperialistic point of view there was a whole class hierarchy system 
that race felt that they are the superior they are the best race in the world they felt that they have the right to to rule the entire world they have the right to rule the entire world because they were the fittest that's what they thought and with that they created this philosophy of survival of the fittest it is not even 200 years since the time this term is been coined but across the world in all our fields of work it has kind of become a re religion it's a, it's like a law we we are operating our lives with this principle i think this fundamentally the the statement is fundamentally wrong because life does not operate on the principle of survival of the fittest life operates on the principle of survival of the kindest and if you see you know in india we always uh, operated from the philosophy of abundance from kindness from sharing this is not our cultural philosophy uh, survival of the fittest is not our cultural philosophy but somehow when we look at it in a business scenario the perception is there are limited resources and you know you have to grab those limited resources i remember just a few days ago i was talking to a filmmaker friend and he said that look there are these young filmmakers who are coming in the field and you know they are spoiling the market by offering their filmmaking services at a at a very low cost at at almost sometime one tenth of the cost i looked at him i said why do you say so he said because survival of the fittest no whoever will offer low cost will get all the business i said no no you're looking at it from a long wrong lens because these young filmmakers are not spoiling the market they are expanding your market they are creating new market now people who never thought of creating media for their business film film media for their business for this social market social media now they are also because they are providing low cost solution so this new breed of entrepreneurs new breed of uh, businesses are also able to use the media hmm, for their marketing so it's a its market is expanding yeah we have abundant in this country especially there is abundant opportunity you know don't look at it from a from a survival of the fittest perspective expand the market and there is enough for everybody here you know again to operate from the philosophy of abundance not from the lack then you know this whole genesis of creating a business what what is a business i mean i look at it because i've been in the business kshetra and i have been in the spiritual kshetra also i look at it the genesis of a business is every business is trying to solve a problem uh, a car manufacturer is trying to solve a problem of mobility a uh, mobile uh, company is trying to solve the pro problem of communication access um, a, a tv is trying to solve the problem of of boredom by providing entertainment etc uh, a toothpaste is trying to solve the problem of oral hygiene so every business every through their product or services are trying to solve a problem right when you're trying to solve a problem the whole attitude is positive the whole attitude is building nurturing supporting helping the humanity to create a better life right now you can't create a better life a positive life a nurturing life if you yourself as business people are operating from the perspective of war of enormous pressure of enormous stress it's like a oxymoronic thought process that i'm aggressively as a as a war trying to create a better world a comfortable world for my customer yeah so it's kind of doesn't go go well together yeah and as i said india is a huge market in business we we thought or there was a philosophy that you know we create artificial demand we create artificial shortage so that we are able to earn the maximum market share but when i look at india i don't think we need to create artificial demand or artificial shortage the market is huge we don't need to create fomo like situation in people's mind to 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 grab their share there is enough for everybody it's a level playing field because if we operate from the philosophy of survival of the fittest then we end up creating that philosophy becomes a 
pillar as a base for our own life also and then everything in our life becomes a struggle and i elaborate on this also but before that let's look at nature is this philosophy true in nature survival of the fittest probably not if you observe nature you know trees in a forest have a network under the earth where all the roots of multiple trees even of different species of trees they provide nutrient to each other if a tree is sick in a forest all the other trees through the network of their roots rush to help the sick tree even if the trees of a different species they transport all the nutrient required for the well-being and health of this tree who is sick in india we have seen that you know there's a there's a bull or a cow on the street and a bird comes on the cow and the bird is sitting on the cow eating something this bird is actually providing kindness to the cow or to this creature by eating the bacteria and other insects and making sure that this this uh, animal is safe that's the principle on on which life also operates yeah the the whole life depends on this cooperation of helping each other out i think that is what has made humans evolve that is what has made life evolve itself there was uh, we were never fighting uh, for survival uh, especially now if we look at i think uh, we all have a very comfortable life nobody is killing us nobody is running after after us to kind of there is no security issues like that yeah we've created a very safe comfortable life for all of us if i look at the human body itself trillions of cells they're all kind to each other and because of their coming together the whole body survives do you know when few cells in our body start to operate from this point of view of survival of the fittest what happens they start to attack each other they start to kill each other in the medical term it is called autoimmune disorder if your own cells start to believe the philosophy which we are teaching in the business world of survival of the fittest our survival of this body will even become difficult autoimmune diseases will come you know i'll give you a way um another side of this how it affects how it's affecting our health you know there's a hormone called cortisol it's it's called a stress hormone cortisol in the business world when we create this philosophy of survival of the fittest a, a war like situation a stress a, a pressure cooker like situation what happens there's a flight and fight response in our system our body starts to secrete this hormone called cortisol and this cortisol when it is released in the blood stream it releases a lot of glucose in the blood because in a war situation your body needs a lot of glucose this cortisol shuts down certain operations from your system so for example your growth hormones are stopped the huh? heartbeat is increased so that you are able to run or fight uh, the energy which goes to the digestive system is blocked and that energy is supplied to the survival system of the body this is nature's design this flight and fight response was given to us so that in a danger situation we are able to you know release this cortisol and are able to either run fast or fight fast and save ourselves but our body is tuned to adapt to this only for a few minutes then it has to come back to normal so that other systems the digestion the the repairing the growth hormone start to work but now imagine in the work scenario we spend 8 9 10 hours in that zone and if it is survival of the fittest then our body is constantly releasing cortisol constantly which means constantly a lot of glucose is released in the blood stream stream maybe that's the reason of the new pandemic of diabetes i don't know i'm just raising the point it also creates a lot of mental imbalances even things like ptsd uh, and stress and uh, split personality and lot of depression is linked to high amount of cortisol release in the blood stream and why that happens because of the situation it's a war zone that is what it is doing to our body and mind also 
I know people, my own personal friends, for them just the thought of going to the office Monday morning meeting is sufficient for them to, to, to release a large dose of cortisol in their body and they would start to, uh, you know, panic. I've seen friends getting panic attacks before a meeting, before a, before a board meeting and things like that. Just because we've created a philosophy of survival of the fittest. Whereas I think the philosophy to lead the life was to be survival of the kindest because this whole life operates on the philosophy of kindness. Let me give you a quick example of two countries. Two countries. We all know these two countries. One country can be considered as the country which believes on survival of the fittest philosophy company country called China. Apparently a fit, strong, aggressive country. Look what's happening to it. Nobody's liking that country anymore. People are hating that country. The country, nobody wants to do business with that country. With that, another example of another country called Tibet. Not the fit, not the strongest. Uh, from popular perspective. But very fit, very strong. From the kindness perspective, it's a very kind country. And see what is happening to Tibet. Their message is reaching across the globe. It is probably the fastest growing philosophy that have, they've created uh, of Buddhism. They're spreading. They're loved by everybody. Everybody wants to help this community. Why? It's the kindest community on earth, probably. Think about it. With this as a, as a base, I want to invite uh, insights from my co-panelist on a certain question. And I first of all invite uh, uh, my friend Vinod. And the question I want to ask my panelists today is, why have we created a business, a, a, a business culture, which feels more like a battlefield? Why, even in our language, in the business language, we use language like, let's kill the competition. It's a prize war. I recently heard another term called talent war. I heard another term called the war room. Boardrooms have become war rooms. Why are we creating this self-hypnosis? Why are we creating businesses which are appearing like battlefields? Uh, Vinod, I want to invite your comments, your input, your insights on this, Vinod. Yeah. Uh, good morning, all. And uh, first of all, would like to thank uh, Sri Anish, the Sados Sangha Foundation and uh, G.P. Rao Garu, uh, who have chosen a very, very relevant and a topical subject. Uh, I think uh, as uh, Sri Anish pointed out, uh, this is something in today's time is very relevant and I think it, it's a great I idea to uh, discuss. So uh, Sri Anish, to answer your question, for us to know uh, what is behind this, what is the genesis of this all? So if you see, since times uh, immemorial, humans have been afflicted uh, with an uncontrollable aspiration of amassing wealth, name, fame, and power, closer to animal in instincts, if I would say so. Now, what happens is that this luring desire clouds the brain, and we feel a strong need to defeat all others no matter what it takes, and thus leading to an aggressive mindset, thought process, and hence, I think, its expression in our language. Uh, as you also said, it's only about 200 years. So in modern times, actually, this has become all the more pressing. Strongly endorsing advocacy of materialism, what is happening is that the organizations and leaders running them see failure of others as the sole index of their own success. So actually what happens is that they go full throttle, competing with each other, mired in conflict, disharmony, and negativity. And the same destructive streak is reflected in our strategies and terminology in the business. Actually, if you see, I feel uh, businesses invariably reflect the 
norms of the societies in which they exist so terms like my way or the highway take no prisoners kill the competition and uh, uh, a very relevant term which, uh, uh, which which is being talked about nowadays and you mentioned that talent war for example right all these they have found their way in the business language of our society where the focus has been on individual achievement and winning at any cost now having said this i firmly believe based on my experience and learning of building few high tech companies and especially at huge city is that companies should not take uh, the so called darwinian term survival of the fittest as a lesson or learning from nature and you also alluded to this that it's a harsh word out there where the weak perish and strong survive okay and that unless you are prepared to meet it with animal aggression you won't last long in fact this is a overly simplistic understanding of how natural systems work actually if we dig deep and you 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 in fact gave few examples we discover that the true lessons they have for us is pretty much the opposite of what we thought collaboration rather than competition so i hope uh, i have been able to throw some light on the question you asked me thank you excellent excellent we know two things which i really you know kind of quickly noted um, out of what you shared is that you know others failure is my success that's you know that's how the human mind is operating or or the business mind is operating very well said we know on this and the the second point you said and maybe we'll come back to it later is you said business reflects the norm of society and my counter um, argument to that would be shouldn't business define the norm for society and when we'll come back to this we'll come back to this because i feel businesses can really define the norms of the society yeah but we'll come back to this rajiv ji you've you've led large businesses you have been you know over 50 years you've been into the world of business many shades of it why have we created a war zone out of out of the a business zone yeah so you know i'm i'm struggling to add to what you have said and what uh, vinod ji said so let me try you see we are stuck in the past uh, there is a dominant uh, dominant narrative that was created by some small group that thought they were victors which was the win lose uh, and actually is more than 200 years old I mean, you have to just go back into history and unfortunately mm -hmm. uh, the history of mankind for, from a particular view point has been of wars has been that either i win or i lose uh, uh, you know the the fight flight all these things are born out of uh, you know uh, millions of years of unconscious memory in the human mind and uh, the question really is that are we do we have the ability to not get stuck in the past are we connected to the reality do we have the courage to question all these things so uh, why are we stuck because we are stuck in the past right and this is the dominant narrative from a particular point of view because if at any time you go out into the society when you move from the owner the shareholder to stakeholders uh, this narrative was never true it was never true it was never win lose it was either lose lose or win win that was always true but the narrative that was developed and which we have blindly followed because you know i think we have paid obeisance to the few victors and these victors either are political powers or even institutes of learning the business schools uh, you know the the shibolets of learning where we blindly follow the harvard business review says this all of us know that there was this wretched uh, jack welch who said something the whole world uh, followed for forced curve etc so i think it's our fear it's our inability to think clearly and it's being prisoners of the past dominant narrative that has led us into this which is by the way totally inadequate and i can build you a solid business case uh, as to why Uh, this whole narrative will not work anymore in an interconnected world in a vuca world in a world where there is pushback and finally where there is climate change and you are damn right sorry to use that word 
business is about solving problem the war is with the problem the war no longer can be with each other no wars have been won uh, even in, in in modern time by any nation look at the us it got its uh, nose bloodied everywhere that it went so that whole narrative has to be questioned we have to get out of the past we have to live in the present we have to be relevant and we are not doing that that's why uh, we are following what we are doing right now the, the narrative the words of war wow wow excellent rajiv ji i'm i'm so glad to hear it from you the conviction with which you are saying that you know that the old needs to be shunned away and we cannot build the new humanity new businesses new thought process with the old wrong narrative which has been imposed on us uh, brilliant 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 thank you thank you rajiv ji uh, vinita ji uh, you know the hum hum of you know preparing the future leaders so to say uh, why are we creating this business warfare where have we gone wrong could you please great um, actually very very happy to be part of this conversation especially uh, i come from marketing stream where these terms are used most often so it's very common for us even as a teacher of marketing to use the terminology like gorilla market fair uh, price wars all these words which you were using and not just what what we were teaching for last couple of decades but also the way we were treating our students and here i i means no words in saying that the way especially uh, the cgpa system of grading students if i can say so and be very very specific around it we are pitting one against another we are telling our students that to grade to get a higher grade you need to uh, be better than others you need not share your knowledge because then everybody knows so see i'm coming from a scenario where it is all opposite and i heard uh, dubey ji mentioning that we are not doing it all needs to be shunned away i also heard suji mentioning that and of course anish ji you also mentioning that in last 200 years we have done so much so much so much and i also heard you mentioning cortisol let me reverse and again in reversing the entire scenario i take the complete responsibility to ourselves and when i say ourselves i am representing the academic world of the country i am taking this responsibility because it belongs to us we have like you know we 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 represent what erstwhile they say the word guru so actually yes the task of setting it right belongs to us because uh, and that's why i may go away from your question because why i i declared yesterday that i'll be participating in this talk some of my students have been you know texting me questions because they have all kinds of confusions because the narrative which we have been having in our school is let's reverse it and you know the time is now you know because all these people whom i can see on the screen we grew up in what we call it as a school of scarcity we grew up in a country which just got independence where everything was in short supply you know like i always say that movies and theater reflects the reality look at the movies when we were growing up i always tell my Uh, tell them and discuss among ourselves movies like mother india movies like kala bazari all that you know where everything was talking of scarcity people were dying everything was in short supply every time i see mother india i actually go in depression because there's so much of pain in that movie fortunately the current generation has grown up on a school of abundance so that is where i know i as an academician i'm extremely hopeful because the future belongs to the generation which has come up in the recent times and believe me they are far 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 better on integrity and when i say integrity it is unison of words thoughts and actions they say what they mean and they do what they think so with this kind of hope you know the 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 responsibility lies with us so yes we have to change this narrative and you know and that's it's so encouraging we at our school are doing small small examples so for an i am it is very unusual to talk of compassion to talk of mindfulness but we've taken it on ourselves that this is the conversation that we are going to make central and i feel extremely proud of a young team of mine 
which has joined me in this in experimentation. So mindfulness for us is not just a word. It is something which we tend to practice on a daily basis. And yes, it is so encouraging to see students asking questions. Like yesterday, somebody asked me, man, what's the difference between compassion and kindness? And believe me, I took it took me a while. But uh, today, I think through this only, I'm answering my student. You know, compassion is what I thought was like, um, it can, it's not something which you can practice. It's like love. Can, can you say that you practice love? No, it's either there or it's not there. So to be compassionate, uh, first thing I thought, and I deeply listened, thought through, and I thought, okay, okay for to be compassionate, you have to have no expectation. Because compassion doesn't flow from a feeling of want. It has to come what we call, if we can, if I can use the word, you know, what we said, overflowing with complete, mm -hmm. completeness. So when you overflow with completeness, compassion will follow. But how do you reach that stage? So the second student asked me, ma'am, how do I reach there? If it is a state of uh, being and state of, you know, I said, okay, one, one shortcut to that is practice kindness. And, uh, you know, do small, small acts of kindness. Uh, and, you know, it may not immediately come. And sorry for use, using such an obnoxious term. Uh, you know, fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. So fake kindness if to start with or start doing it even if it is not coming from within start doing it and you know when you will do it do it do it and look at what you will get so in our school we practice a small small act of kindness maybe offering a lift to someone because we live in a very small city where even getting public transport can be a problem so we offer such small things and i tell them you know look at your own state of mind when you would do it so we'll not talk cortisols we will talk oxytocin, mm -hmm. <laughs> See, you know, Excellent. So I keep telling them, you know, get this feel, get this high. And then you would know after acts and acts and acts of doing it, you will feel fulfilled. Mm. You will possibly have a glimpse of completeness. And that would be a moment of compassion. Mm. So, you know, mm. I'm so sorry, maybe I'm not answering the question, but I'm taking this forum to answer those questions which my mm. students keep posing me. <laughs> that how do I become compassionate? What is this whole business, abstract business of kindness? Yeah. And you somebody could... was asking me, ma'am, I'm kind to some people, I'm not kind to someone <laughs> else. So what is this business? Yeah. You, uh, I, I would suggest you could, you could send some of these students to us. You know, just yeah. give give them to me exactly. for a and, semester. And then, exactly. <laughs> and believe me, these are the kind of conversations yeah. which are needed. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about all of us, we are talking about 200 years. Why don't we go back? So, Dubeji, it's not about shunning history. It is about going deeper into history. And I don't want to sound leftist or rightist or anything, but the answers lie there. Hmm. India has been one of the most ancient civilizations. And I keep telling my students, you know, the biggest test is test of time. If we have stood this is strong for so long, it is only because we were doing some things which were very, very right. Hmm. So Excellent. what was right is what we need to pick up without yeah. getting apologetic hmm. about it. Yes. So very yes, well, very well. Sitting in very an well. Eye, I should be talking about this. Absolutely. There is nothing wrong in it because actually the results lie would, would lie there. And the best thing is that today's generation is very, very okay with it. Yeah. Maybe because of all this, uh, you know, suppression and labeling that our generation indulged in, they're sick and tired of it. So they are ready to, you know, look at another way of, sorry for my going all over, but <laughs> <laughs> how I feel. And I, responsibility belongs yeah. to us. Correct. I, I can see your passion, Vinita Ji, when you're talking about this. And I'm so glad that as an academician, as an institution, you are, you're believing in this, you're feeling about this. And, you know, things like mindfulness is being introduced to the students. Excellent. Excellent. I'll, I'll quickly come back to you, Vinita Ji, on this. Yeah, Quick, quickly come back to you on that. Okay. Now, with that, let's also, you know, in this session, I also want to get insights from our extreme panelists about, you know, what has this attitude done to us or what is this attitude still doing to us? So my second question, and I, I invite uh, 
uh, Rajiv ji to um, uh, go first on this is that Rajiv ji in your experience you must have seen that what has this attitude of survival of the fittest has done to the health which is physical and mental health of the of the employees of the people in the in the business and on the overall health of the planet what is the impact of this philosophy could you please share some thoughts on that okay in in, in two words it erodes and it destroys the potential so let me just elaborate very quickly uh, it is creating so much anxiety and fear in in people that the energy that they should be devoting to solving the problem to expanding the potential of the ecosystem and of the people to solve the problem that is going in fighting anxiety and in fighting fear so by the pure laws of physics the potential of the ecosystem to solve the problems which its purpose is is getting drained that's what it's doing and the same thing is happening uh, 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 at the level of the planet you know after all mother earth uh, can only be pillaged uh, and i hate to use the word uh, destroyed i was going to use a stronger word but i'm not going to do that uh, you know because now it it's it's not forever going to give you everything and you keep on destroying it so uh, i would say that the erosion and destruction of the potential of organizations at mac micro and macro level is getting destroyed uh, and energy is being drained in fighting uh, paranoia and anxiety and at the level of the planet we are just destroying the the planet and it's not sustainable anymore wow excellent thought rajiv ji the way you've put it you know it's I'm so glad to hear this that you brought this up in this conversation is that this attitude is a leak on our energy and this is also eroding the potential which hum human beings have or which collective human beings have when they work in an institution phenomenal way to look at it I'm I'm so glad you brought it up we know what's your thought on this what is it doing to us this this uh, whole so battlefield what? yeah so what i i will do is i'll i'll focus on uh, our businesses and our companies and uh, how it impacts in our day to day working so basically a philosophy that reflects uh, survival of the fittest winners take all attitude only makes people operate in their own silos and create stresses okay and with my experience of more than 3 uh, decades i can tell you that organizations may miss out on very important suggestions observations and viewpoint of their employees who are not pushy aggressive or when when we talk about uh, fittest i also mean maybe having very high intellect and all of us know that it's not just the iq which, which makes a difference okay so all this negatively affects the health relationship and the overall well-being of the employees and i'm sure all of uh, us will agree that in these times of covid induced work from home these negativities they percolate the stresses to the families too okay and here i would like to briefly talk about the con concept of psychological safety which is very closely related to the topic we are discussing and amongst organizations uh, google in fact after extensive uh, research and analyzing performance of teams across thousands of their employees and hundreds of uh, teams across uh, uh, the world uh, they found that psychological safety as the single most important factor which determined uh team effectiveness and performance okay so what is the psychological safety it is being able to show an employee oneself without fear of negative consequences of self image status or career or to put it uh, differently a shared belief held by the members that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking so what is happening is uh, in 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 uh, organization setting we are always evaluating interpersonal risks often unconsciously should i speak up or stay quiet should i be open honest candid or should i hold back and act 
actually what happens is that we err on the side of safety. People in the meetings, they hold back, often hold back when they believe that what they have to say could be important for the organization, for the customers or for themselves. Voicing a concern in a meeting, okay, or giving an unpleasant yet necessary feedback to a coll colleague, sharing a different perspective on an issue, all these are very essential at work. And without psychological safety, what happens is people hold back, okay? Problems go unreported. Improvement opportunities are ignored, okay? And occasionally, tragic failures occur, okay? Because something, if somebody would have spoken, could have been avoided. And over time, this lack of psychological safety can cause uh, actually not just uh, impact the performance, but can be a cause for resistance to change, lack of innovation. And in, in, in the context, uh, we, we have heard this uh, term called great resignation wave. In fact, this is something which can lead to higher attrition. And the recent pandemic actually has added to this complexity, okay? In fact, we all have heard about this term called VUCA world. The pandemic actually has made this hyper VUCA. And I think organizations have started recognizing that they need a radically new view and fresh ideas, okay, to thrive and survive in this hyper VUCA world. To sum it up, I would say that the overall well being of employees, okay, the paradigm has to change. It has to be a win-win paradigm and not a winner-takes-all paradigm. Excellent. Excellent, Vinod. Whenever I hear leaders like you speak this, you know, my, my hope of for, for an awakened humanity is suddenly, you know, takes on to a very different uh, level. And I'm, I'm so glad you and Rajivji both, you, you've actually said, both of you, that this, if we operate from this philosophy of survival of the fittest, it's actually a dent in the business. Uh, it pushes people in their silos. It does not provide them. And, and you beautifully talked about psychological safety. I mean, when you know people perform to their optimum best, when they are not perceiving anything as a threat, when the whole atmosphere environment of the organization is nurturing, when they're not being judged. They're not being pushed on the side because they're not aggressive, as you said. Beautifully put, Vinod. I'm, I'm so glad you you put it in such a way. Um, Vinita ji, your thoughts on this. What is this doing to our physical mental health and to, to the environmental health all around us? See, uh, coming from the, again, from the academic world, I'm expected to be sharing more in terms of the research is happening in this area. So, um, of course, and as I said, that we at our school, uh, we are trying to put it across in a little more researched fashion, because if we just talk words, the younger generation need a lot of uh, data, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, since I live with more with the left brain people who need a lot of uh, empirical evidence around it. So let me talk in terms of empirical evidences. Uh, very clearly, there are some researchers which show, like there's a research done by Yuva Angel and Anusha, wherein they have proved that uh, there is a very, compassion has an important predictor for entrepreneurial decision making. So what they did is they created two groups, one control group and an experimental group. And in an experimental group, they made them do some loving kindness meditation. And the results clearly showed that there, is a, that there is a very strong relationship between that loving kindness meditation and the sustainable decision making, which in turn is mediated by compassion. So when Suji was making talking and everybody was talking of that, how we need to be more, you know, entrepreneurs and the business people have to make more sustainable decisions. So clearly compassion acts as a mediator. 
there are enough researches again which talk about role of compassion and kindness in leadership theories and thomas and rollon in 2014 has research big time around it i think all of us are aware of this book kindness in leadership by gay haskins where he did talk about that how you know we have to put kindness as an agenda so there is enough research available in the literature and in the in the in the research realm which clearly shows that this is the way going forward not talking about on physiological health like today i was talking of oxytocin yes there is a very clear research which says that this oxytocin basically it is created by ha having these warm warm feelings it could be by hugging sharing warm stories sharing moments of kindness anything and it very clearly has an effect on what we call it as cardiovascular system there are some receptor sites in our arteries which is like you know landing sites and uh, it's lining all our arteries and whenever oxytocin is produced it creates what is known as nitric oxide and that expands the arteries so again researchers have very clearly shown that oxytocin acts of kindness they will dilate your arteries which in turn will lower your blood blood pressure so again if i look at it there's a very logical reason for practicing this so if you want to remove stress if you want to uh, be healthy this is the way going forward and that's why i share this with uh, you know with my young among young students also because one long ago i i became fan of one of the statements of uh, mother teresa where she said that uh, don't call me to anti war rallies call me to a peace rally so you know let's again talk about the conversation that okay you want to be healthy and mind you this is a very very relevant conversation especially post post cap pandemic where everybody wants to remain healthy everybody wants to have high immunity because people have seen their own loved ones going away so it's up close personal in the face that you have to have a better health so okay if this serves as a prompter there's enough research which shows that if you want to be healthy if you don't want to have diseases this is the way going forward so you know when we share it so empirically with the young audience there seemingly is a far more convincing story i think this should be told in the organizations also that if you are facing stress might might well as do something like this and if you want to be a great leader might well as some do something like this because you know these are stories are compelling stories and uh, and as i said um enough enough evidences are there so i remember even when in a i was in a b school we used to have examples like body shop where being compassionate led to success not treating things on animals led to success and again i would re, re, reinforce my faith in today's generation you know it it i think for centuries people were wearing fur but look at the situation today nobody is wearing fur nobody is wearing pashmina nobody is creating cruelty on animals so that means this generation is reacting very beautifully so just let's these you know wherever since we say wherever the attention is going so let's put our attention let's just put spotlights there mm -hmm. on those success stories and i think mm -hmm. that would lead lot of people to follow that because till now we've been saying that you to kill others to survive no now you have to put stories that wow people thrived by being mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. i think another thing vinita ji we should do is that you know bring uh, uh, corporate success stories and leaders like let's say vinod ji or rajiv ji whom we have the chance to listen to to the younger generation to the aspiring you know i am students let's say to so let's say if vinod shares the story of kindness and and how it helps the business to grow i mean it's a proof that you know the earlier narrative is not working anymore or it was a wrong narrative to begin with <laughs> anish that's why whenever i meet industry and today again i'm using this platform please industry captains become kind spare your time and energy to be on campus in a very selfless yeah. way yeah and share yeah. your success stories with the youth of the today Good. that's the only way you can mm -hmm. see because if rajiv ji says that i reached the top but i was kind yeah then it is Correct. compelling story absolutely yeah. and and i remember when uh, few few days ago you know i had a conversation with rajiv ji 
and uh, uh, he shared three mantras that he has been following in his entire life i don't know if he'll share those three mantras with us but i encourage him to share that along with the question that i want to ask him now uh so it's been proved in this discussion so far that survival of the kindest is the way forward it makes a lot of business sense also it's healing to the body mind psychological health of us and of the planet as a whole now with that rajiv ji what is it that the leaders must do to create a more sustainable perspective and and i say the more sustainable perspective is survival of the kindest uh, and maybe you want to share your three mantras of life with all of us uh, maybe i should start by sharing the three mantras in case i forget so for me it's been satya prem and seva satya means to speak the truth regardless of the consequences prem is compassion the ability to put myself into the shoes of the other person and seva of course is a spirit of service uh, so that's the answer to this question one can elaborate on it and they have all very profound uh, consequences for business uh let me come back to the role of the leader uh let me first say that given uh, the new normal in which we are operating and which will intensify and that new normal is highly interconnected volatile uncertain and uh, complex and ambiguous push back by all stakeholders and then the environmental change so that's the context in that uh, i think for any organization to survive uh, there has to be the ability to take proactive and iterative decision making at all points in the value chain right this in turn in my opinion requires distributed leadership and that distributed leadership Uh, has to be uh, accompanied by a deep knowledge of stakeholders that we interact with right now to have distributed leadership and to have that deep knowledge you need to create trust and you, you need you need to have compassion and kindness is a necessary but not sufficient condition to create that trust and compassion so that's the business case now what do leaders have to do the leaders first have to Uh, i think articulate uh, and make sure th- or or try very hard that people internalize the purpose of the organization and the values then uh, having communicated that obviously they have to have strategy structure process as the metrics but with that so called hardware the software of culture has to be created by the leader and what is culture culture is the way we behave in our everyday life as we go around taking business decisions how do you create the culture for uh, the people here or uh, it is through what we call the uh, hr uh, 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 hr levers right but most of all the leader must walk the talk and it's not just when i say leader it's not that one person leadership is a cascading uh, living breathing organism and uh, for me uh, Uh, anyone who has at least one person looking up to him or her is a leader which means almost everybody is a leader so it is this ecosystem of purpose and values internalizing it communicating it uh, in addition to having the hardware of strategy structure processes and metrics to have the so called software which is much harder than the hardware by the way of culture and behavior through the hr levers and most of all for the leaders and the leadership to walk the talk to walk the talk i could go on and on but uh, i stop here excellent excellent uh, we know we know your your thoughts on that so again ad- adding to what uh, uh, rajiv ji said and and this is based on my experience of building and leading large uh, high performance teams i would say uh, leaders uh, certainly they have a very very key role in creating a culture and an environment uh, which promotes and nurtures kindness empathy and a psychologically safe workplace and the most important factor that determines as we saw the psychological safety of a team is the leader's role modeling of the right behaviors mm. so when a leader provides an environment which promotes survival of the kindest and is psychologically safe it it brings in a plethora of uh, positive virtues 
and and just just to uh, elaborate uh, such environment it it will promote learning creativity knowledge sharing nobody is going to uh, treat knowledge as power okay they will share knowledge uh, they will be learning from mistakes failures will not be looked down upon uh, it will help teams to take advantage of diversity it it will reduce conflicts and uh, uh, this one man ship okay and this definitely is going to be keep talking about employee engagement okay this is something which will enhance employee engagement resulting into reduced attrition and and in terms of the business result this definitely is going to improve performance so basically teams that provides opportunities for all to speak up promote empathy and collaboration and make each team member feel safe okay uh, it it is now clearly proven by research okay that uh, these teams they outperform uh, even other teams within the same organization okay so for leaders to succeed at gaining commitment from all members of their teams and and these will be members who who have to learn to speak up those who have to create space for others those who have to learn intellectual humility okay those who have to manage heated debate debates okay so these people have to feel deeply inspired i would say and invested in that change journey instead of seeing it as a top down or simply a nice to say uh, hmm. thing okay so i firmly believe that along with leaders and i think uh, mr rajiv also alluded to that uh, everybody key team members have to be uh, role models okay uh, they 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 have to walk the talk hmm. okay so a culture as we all know is not uh, built simply by changing a individual behavior but it needs change of group behavior mm. so that so, is something which uh, based on my experience uh, i thought i i would share excellent excellent vinod so from uh, individual behavior to the change or or process to change the collective behavior uh, phenomenal and creating the modeling the role models to kind of create a certain uh, exemplary atmosphere there excellent vinita ji your thoughts on this uh, uh see again i do agree with what these two people two leaders were talking that uh, a leader has to be setting the tone and i have always felt and since uh, i am sharing it more as my role as a founder director uh right from day one i i i have shared it with my team and i felt it myself that the founding team which includes me as well our main objective purpose and biggest uh, duty is to set the culture in the organization mm. and when i say set the culture in the organization create a culture uh definitely a uh, little aspirational culture which is all about compassion which is all about new way of living mm. which is what we are trying to uh, pass it on to our new generation something which we already always knew in ancient times we to re- rekindle it and put it across to the current generation so this is how my entire team has seen as our role that create a culture so yes that would that would entail all of it um, you know walking the talk and being that oneself like i have always uh, i think 2018 is when i wrote my uh, wrote our messages together or wrote our vision together where we said that okay it's not about to do it is about to be that we have to be ourselves that now a couple of things which has helped us as a team i would like to share this in this platform like you know um Uh, because i live with young people so they have they are coming to terms with their own emotions they are coming to terms with their own personalities and especially in today's time and you know we we generation were very lucky that we social media was not there 
today's generation, life is very difficult because this, all this impact has made them very auto-directed. So all the, um, you know, affirmations and all the validation, somehow they tend to seek from outside. And in all of it, how do we make them centered? As an, as an academician, that's a challenge for us as a team. And we tend to kind of address that by creating small, small practices. Like, uh, you know, as I said, they have all kinds of innocent questions. So other day, uh, one student came back, came to me and he was, he was a gold, like kind of a gold medalist. And all of a sudden, his grades started dropping and we asked him, what's the reason? So apparently, on a conscious level, there was nothing. But when we probed deeper, I could recognize that he had some very intense competitive feeling with another person who was kind of inching mm. towards him in terms of CGPA. Mm. And that was leading to that lack of concentration. And so much so that there was an almost on the bordering of animosity. Mm. So, you know, when people are becoming enemies and they're treating each other as foes, I was kind of contemplating how do I help this person? Sometimes it happens even on young team members. And again, I would say my team is also very, very young. So we're kind of learning and teaching each other. And somewhere I read it, sounds very esoteric, uh, but I thought of sharing it with him and it has helped me. So I'm using this platform of sharing with others as well. I said, you know, uh, early in the morning, set it with one of the routine that you do every day and bring this person in front of you. So this so-called enemy of yours, and you know, uh, give him some loving gesture. Could be a flower, could be samosa, could be pakora, but offer this to him with a lot of love. He says, how is it possible? But so I said, you try and do it. And believe me, he, he said, okay, now you're saying it, let me try. So every day when he sat for studying, and when this other fellow started bothering him and hampering his concentration, he started offering one of his favorite sweet dish, which was malpua to him. Okay, come, have malpua. Vineta ji, you're not doing justice in on Sunday morning by talking about <laughs> samosas and malpuras. And, you know, a lot of us have not had our breakfast yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I can be cruel as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, please be kind, Vineta ji. Yeah, so basically it meant that, yes, that student actually... Uh, you know, he overcame that challenge which he was facing and he realized post that he was concentrating better on his studies. So that block which he was facing, he was able to overcome itself himself. So there are small, small things with which we try and help our team members to create that culture that, okay, you can't surmount people by animosity. You have to be a little kind to them. And, you know, and I, there's one word which we keep sharing, that if you hate somebody, you need to know him more. Because everybody carries a story. Mm -hmm. It's just that you don't know him. Anymore. Correct, correct. So these oh, yeah. conversations... Yeah. Vinikaji, be... can I come back yeah? to you? You you seem to have a lot of stories, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a professor. So you should not have given me mic, you know. That's a, that's a challenge. No, no, I, I think there are some phenomenal inputs that you're showing. I'm so glad that as a head of a you know management institution you are wired that and you're looking at life and students future that way i mean so we're so glad to have you on the platform but just looking at the time uh, and looking at gp um, <laughs> i know gp we yeah i just wanted uh, the, uh, a few questions from the audience gee, to gee, be taken gee, gee. Ah. Uh, before that gp i just want our uh, panelists to give us one statement uh, and please one statement only um, of, and I, this could be difficult, but just fit, fit it in one statement of any practical example that you can share with our audience here where you can display that the kindness really worked. Yeah, kindness really worked. One practical situation from your professional life, I would say. Um, we start with Vinod. Uh, so, in fact, drawing uh, from our own culture, okay, uh, uh, the concept of uh, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, okay, that world is one large family. Uh, we, we have practiced this since our inception at Hughes 60, 16 years back. And to, uh, to just give you an idea, during these 16 years, uh, we 
we have uh, gone through pretty difficult times. Uh, we have weathered uh, three storms, so as to say. The worst uh, economic meltdown which the world has seen, 2008-2009. The telecom consolidation uh, during the decade of 2010, okay? And the current pandemic. And what I would like to say is that uh, the culture and the value system which uh, we, we have built at Hughes City, where we treat all employees, all members as part of one family, and the feeling that we are there for each other in good times and in bad times, okay, and uh, we, we are there to help each other, support each, each other, and I'm very happy to say that we are not only weathered these storms, but we have come out strongly. We have grown as an organization. We are doing well. So that is something I wanted to share in terms of a practical insight, okay? And based on our own journey, that uh, this is not an esoteric term, uh, survival of the kindest, but we, we have practiced that within our organization and we have not only been able to survive, but uh, we, we have thrived and, and uh, we have grown. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Vinita ji, one, one statement, one sentence, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, you were looking for examples that ji, ji. Uh, like the kindness works and I think um, uh, Foreign, uh, foreign institution, like uh, in, typically in Bihar, they say that it takes at least one and a half decades for an institution to come up. The very fact that in about two and a half years or three years, we are up and running itself is a testimony that kindness works because we've made it a hallmark, at least in, in our very small team. And we've seen ourselves great results. Uh, great results in terms of getting best of the human beings working here, best of the students coming and getting attracted here by the conversations. So if it's too early for me to make such an esoteric statement, but if in a decade's time we are able to walk the talk which you're talking, that itself would say that in a competitive B-school, kindness world. Excellent, excellent, Vinita ji. Excellent, uh, Rajiv ji. Uh, In one sentence. Yes, please. The Mahindra Rise Initiative to drive positive change in the lives of our stakeholders and communities through the way we conduct our business. We've been working on it for the last fifteen years. Such, sorry, more than one sentence. Sorry. I could go on and on. There's a Harvard Business School uh, case yeah, study that has come out in April 2020. <laughs> it's a case study. It's a case study. I can talk about oh, it. Wow. Wonderful. Oh. We at some some point, uh, Rajiti, we should actually do a s session on this, on the uh, Mahindra Rise case study. And I am personally very keen to uh, read this case study. So I'll get in touch to get a copy of that from you. Uh, great. Thank you, Rajivji. Uh, with that, friends, we've come uh, to our question answer section. Uh, with with your permission, uh, Dr. GP, shall we go ahead with the questions of the participants? Let's, let's take a few questions. Yes. And what we'll do is uh, you pick up the most relevant and uh, insightful questions uh, and prioritize those. And for others, we will reach out to the panelists, get their answers and we will send the answers to the participants. I think that's a practical solution. Right? Perfect, perfect, sounds good. So, um, okay, since I have the liberty to uh, pick up the question, so I'm looking at it. Uh, okay, so there's a question by Dr. Harivansh Chaturvedi ji of BIMTECH. Um, and he, he says, uh, can we expect a collaborative global economy in this decade when a few big tech firms are likely to control it as oligarchs, who will control these giant firms? Uh, very pertinent question, though uh, he's asked it from me, but I would um, request Vinod to share his insights on this. Uh, Vinod, please. So I, I think, again, we, we are coming uh, with this uh, uh, thought of who is going to control, okay? So again, instead of... Uh, thinking in those terms, in terms of who is going to control, I think 
what is going to work and that that's where i think the industry also is talking about that there has to be some kind of self regulation okay and the companies also have to come together and collaborate okay so that is my short answer to this hmm. question okay excellent excellent and i'll also say uh, dr hivansh my two cents on this uh yes in the practical world on the ground uh, we see some big tech giants kind of taking over the smaller businesses etc uh but what i've seen in the in the world or in the smaller areas where i live now if you promote the local economy by making sure that you know you do an extra bit by let's say uh you know going to that shop and you know picking up your grocery from that shop it really fuels the local level entrepreneurship and the way our country is is set i think if we can continue to fuel that it will create a balance and it will not be you know overtaken by a few large firms so to say uh, so that's that's what i would say there's another interesting question by uh, kk upadhyay ji uh, somehow it is again addressed to me but i'll open it up to others also it says does place matter i stay in delhi and you just take your car on the road and the fighting spirit starts <laughs> i notice you stay in dharamchala does it make a difference uh, i've lived in both the worlds huh? i was in delhi and gurgaon at the peak of madness there and then i'm in dharamchala now so i've seen both the worlds uh, my personal answer to this would be yes and no both uh, unfortunately life is a combination of yin and yang both so uh, let me elaborate quickly on that how why i'm saying yes and no there is a time in your life when you are so much in the grind that your mind needs certain calmness of a space calmness of a certain sangha so that you are able to maintain this balance and this understanding grows in you the understanding of world is kind you need a break from the regular rush uh but once you've taken that break it could be 3 day break or 3 years break i don't know depends on you uh uh but these smaller breaks in between your regular life gives you a glimpse of the kindness uh, or the glimpse of a of a certain rhythm and a pace of life uh, which is not competitive and once you get the gim- glimpse of that it is very easy for you to integrate that back into your daily life yeah uh, so yes and no both uh, i hope it makes sense um there's another uh, interesting question <coughs> uh it's by dr divakar dhadu and he says it seems in the corporate world onus is on leadership to emphasize on kindness unless large part of the corporate world does so it may not become a movement imagine this very discussion happening before the pandemic started do you think it would have helped the nation not to have so many people left jobless and unemployed by organizations in pursuit of their profitability or even as an excuse to downsize tough question um and i come to rajiv ji for that uh, because it's a tough question rajiv uh, no 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 so uh, uh, my own view uh, is that these things you're right it's a movement and an ecosystem has to be created and yet we can all make a difference by the small actions that we take in the here and now and every day and therefore we should do that and not wait for the whole world to change before we start doing our bit so we need to take responsibility in the here and now so i think that's very important number 2 my own view is that in the pure pursuit of even bottom line maximization i mean for a moment i i give it that all right shareholder value maximization uh, is to be pursued i don't agree with that by the way you have to treat labor not as a short term cost to be minimized but actually as one of those rare appreciating assets which if invested in properly will give you returns in terms of improvements in productivity and innovation that will far outweigh the the cost that you incur so it's a very myopic view uh, to treat labor or human resources as a short term cost to be minimized which is actually what happened during the pandemic uh, the downsizing you know i mean if you look at the cost structure of a firm and not all firms but many firms labor is a very small part of it but the first thing we want to slash is the is the labor cost because it's so easy to do that 
So, I mean, uh, you know, so there is a whole mindset uh, shift that has to take place and uh, uh, that will take some time and leaders have to stand up, but there's pure economic logic driving that. And uh, yeah. having said that, Let's not wait for the world to change. Let's take responsibility for our own action and let's do what we believe in to help with what the rest of the world is doing. Yeah. Excellent, Rajiv. Excellent. And I, I see your passion comes from and now I know why you sit on the board of ILO uh, Geneva. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, this is a, so, uh, GP, just allow me to take two quick questions. Huh? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. And this I would uh, ask Vinit. Vinita ji to give a quick uh, insight on this. Uh, the question is from Sachin Mahajan and he asked, does the culture and organization percolate from culture of country and India has ancient culture of kindness and caring? Does that help? Vinita ji, your, your quick, quick insight on that. See, uh, it, like technically if you define culture, it's like as we all know, it's all about the beliefs, the values, you know all that which you get from the environment which in 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 any case is generally the country or the the milieu in which it is set and which is why again and again i think twice or thrice in the conversation i emphasized and uh, more so specifically in my my domain which is education that there is so much that we knew and that there are so much that we need to remember that there were certain ways of doing things. As a nation, we were the most inclusive. As a nation, mm. the whole philosophy of doing things was that of kindness. Like if you, even today, if you go to the rural economy, you will see the entire growth is based on collaboration and cooperation. And the way our entire, like, and which is the testimony of the fact that why we could survive for so long for thousands and thousands of years because it was all rested in that culture of cooperation it rested in the culture of uh, you know we go in it together so uh, if we just um, forget about the last 200 years which has done a lot of damage to us if we just go back to our own roots and we rekindle those feelings and those philosophies start showing that yes that is the way going forward we would we would actually get it right okay um uh, quickly my one cent on what vinita ji shared on this question uh, see in the discussion we've come up with with the understanding that definitely there is a business case for inculcating kindness or cultivating kindness as business culture also and we as as Indian or as sitting in this country we have a great heritage of this nation uh, whose whole philosophy is is based on compassion, loving kindness, and 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 uh, you know sharing. So we are in a great position to actually use this business case and and grow much faster and actually become a role model probably for the whole world to inculcate in in this global business scenario. So that's I thought I'll add. This is a very interesting question. I'm very tempted to take it. I know it's time, but uh, I pose it to Vinod. I'm sure he can do justice to the time. The question is from Aman Verma. And uh, he says, you know, will kindness not encourage indiscipline in the organization? Vinod. So I, I, I think the, these are two separate things. When, when we are talking about kindness and empathy and being considerate, we are, we are not saying that uh, you, you accept uh, bad performance or, or you accept wrong behavior or, or you ac accept indiscipline. So I think we, we should not mix this. These are two separate things. Okay. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. And, and I would again, uh, we would like to add one statement on that, that because of, let's say, an indiscipline issue, you have to fire an employee. That firing can also be done with a lot of kindness and compassion. Yeah. Yeah. So perfect. Uh, there are tons of questions and I'm glad, I mean, this looking at the number of questions gp it says that you know the kindness is going to grow in corporate india yeah i'm very uh, hopeful for that uh, but looking at the time i think we'll have to leave these questions we'll come back with we the will answers. answer to the questions and uh, i want to make an exception there is sahil nair he's one of the most dynamic uh, uh, mid level hr and he connects the millennials and the senior people so he has raised his hand three times 
Uh, Sahil, you want to ask a question? Sahil Nair? Okay, it's okay. We'll go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, Sahil says yes. Uh, Sahil, you want to ask something, Sahil? Absolutely. Thank you so much, GP. Really appreciate. I'm going to take 30 seconds and I'll leave this to you, Anish Ji, to decide who from the panel would you like to answer this question. Um, the question is, you know, when we surround ourselves with kind people, it's the natural affinity, right? So you also want to be kind. But uh, many times when kindness is not reciprocated in terms of expectation, the natural tendency to be kind, and here I'm talking about the common man, not of evolved souls, but the common man may find it very difficult to then be naturally kind. So any kind of thoughts or guidance on how do you make it intrinsic rather than dependent on reactions of people? That's my question back to you. Thank okay. you, GB, for the opportunity. Great, Thank great, great, great. So uh, allow me to uh, quickly uh, say a few words on that. Uh, Sahil, number one, we're not doing kindness for the sake of the world. Let's understand this. We are doing kindness for our own sake. Because as I said earlier, the more kind I am, the more balanced I am, the more in a non-suffering zone I am. So it is my kindness is its own reward. Yeah, kindness is its own reward. My own cortisol levels are under control if I am kind, right? So it benefits me. When something benefits you, you're not really then looking at a reciprocal effect from the world. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? It is your own benefit. Yeah. Yes, when you, when there's a reciprocation, when there's a positive reinforcement, it, it gives you a sense of more joy. I totally agree with you. But inherently, if you remain kind, it, it helps your own nervous system, your own performance, your own well-being. So, so I think for things like these, we must not be dependent, and I'm using the word dependent, we must not be dependent on the reciprocal effect because we're doing it for ourselves. We're not doing it for anybody else. We're not doing anybody any favor by becoming more kind. There I rest my case. By allowing Sahil to raise that question, we don't expect a thank you from him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I propose, uh, Sri Anish and the panelists is, we will stick to the time. We will close it formally. Keep the Zoom on. Let there be an informal discussion with, if permitting your time permitting, we will take some more questions. People are raising hands. So what we'll do is we will stick to the original time. We are supposed to sum it up now. So mm -hmm. one way of summing it up is each one of you saying one liner. <laughs> Once we tried that in Orissa, that one liner ran into 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you later, but now that one liner should be five, 10 seconds, each one of you, one liners. Uh, we start from Rajiv Ji, please yeah. Rajiv Ji. Kindness is good for you and for the organization and the business that you do. Thank you. Thank beautiful, you. Beautiful, beautiful. Vinod Ji. So what I would say is that the more generous uh, and considerate the companies are, the greater will be the employee's sense of ownership and belongingness. Beautiful, beautiful. Vinita ji. Uh, again, something which I say to my youngsters, uh, you know, whatever they do is their business. You just treat them the way you should. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so and, you have got choices. Huh. You can uh, get us meditate. You can <laughs> you have open a closing remark. Uh, anything yes. Else. Yes. So, so um, I would like all of us to experience just a one minute of meditation. Yeah, just one minute of meditation. So I ask all of you to your right hand, keep your right hand uh, in the center of your chest, in the center of your chest where the rib cage meets. Keep your left hand on top of the right hand. Yeah, like this. Yeah. Now you may please close your eyes. Now you may please close your eyes. Take a deep breath, everybody. Feel absolutely relaxed. You might notice the neurons in your brain are active, very active at this moment. Take a few deep breaths to normalize them.
One more deep breath. Now I will say three statements with your closed eyes. You repeat these statements in your own consciousness silently with your closed eyes. First statement. I feel safe and I feel cared for. Repeat in your consciousness. I feel safe and I feel cared for. One more time. I feel safe and I feel cared for. Take a deep breath. Now repeat. I feel deeply nurtured because the world is kind to me. Once again. I feel deeply nurtured because the world is kind to me. I feel deeply nurtured because the world is kind to me. Take a deep breath, friends. I promise to spread more kindness all around through my thoughts, through my words, through my actions. I promise to spread more kindness all around through my thoughts, my words, my action. One more time, friends. I promise to spread more kindness all around through my thoughts, through my words, through my actions. Take a deep breath again. And with a joyful expression, kindly open your eyes, friends. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, over to you, GP, over to you. You're on mute, GP, you're on mute. Thank you so much, uh, the panelists and the moderator, Sri Anish, for a wonderful session. So it's over to the audience now. We were to sum up this conference, this or the on-conference. So instead of we doing it, each one of you is a leader. You please sum it up in one liner, one word, one line in the chat box. We'll collate that knowledge. We'll collate that summary. We'll collate that response. We collate that thought and create a treasure of information, insight for the youngsters in building that new humanity. Over to the audience, please do that.